most amazing thing has happened. Frontier, the creators of Planet Zoo, have invited me to San Diego, California to go to the San Diego Zoo and be a zookeeper for a day. What? After literally hundreds of hours of volunteering at conservation groups in real life and literally thousands of episodes of being a digital zookeeper, it's finally time to put all of that into practice and become a real life zookeeper for a day for none other than the one and only Galapagos tortoise. Let's go. The San Diego Zoo opened over 100 years ago and has grown into one of the largest and most influential zoological organizations in the world. They were among the first of the nonprofit zoos to prioritize animal welfare, both in the zoo and in the wild. Today, they are one of the world's top conservation institutions and have helped to reintroduce endangered species to every continent on Earth. To help fight against extinction, they support over 1,000 worldwide conservation projects, including ones that save and protect some of the most threatened species in the world, like our friends, the Galapagos tortoises. Good morning, okay. boys. Good morning, guys. Come oh, here. Oh, look at them, just rushing to breakfast. Aldo, you want a bite? Wow. Yes, this is Alda right here. Abbott is coming over to the left, and here comes Calvin, Calvin and Oliver. And Oliver. Oh, they're so handsome. They are, and these guys are actually the original residents of San Diego Zoo. These guys have been here since the 1920s. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're all over 100 years old. Every one of them mm -hmm. right here? Oh, that's Yeah, amazing. so they came in the 20s, but they were actually born in Galapagos Islands uh, in the late 1800s. So they're all anywhere between 100 and 130. So all between 100 and 130. Yeah. Wow. And are they all from the same island right here? Because this, uh, Albert? Abbott, yes. Abbott. Yeah, so exactly. Islands, you can tell the different islands have different uh, adaptations. Mm -hmm. So some of the islands that have the higher vegetation, their shells will kind of come up on a curve so they can reach high. And then on the, uh, some of the islands that have really low vegetation, their shells will kind of dip down more, so they have more cover protection on the bug, but then can eat all the good greens that are close to the ground. That are down there. Well, and I read that on the Galapagos Islands, when they're moving around, they like create turtle or tortoise highways, and they help to disperse the seeds and really keep the islands rejuvenated. Exactly. These guys are herbivores, so they do a huge part in helping our planet. They eat a lot of fruits and veggies, and with that is comes yeah the seeds dispersal. So they bring new life. <laughs> yeah, I've read about them being called like the gardeners of the island. Yes. Which made me think, oh wow, that's really cool. Just slow moving gardeners moving through, because there's not a lot of native plant life on the islands. But if they're moving around and helping to disperse it, exactly they're keeping everything going. Yeah, the Galapagos were our volcanic islands, so. Mm -hmm. A lot of the land there is very dry, and yeah, it definitely needs that to get all the all the vegetation. Well, and speaking of the volcanic island, I was wondering, like, wait, how did the tortoise get to a volcanic island? It wasn't like a landmass that broke off exactly. from the continents. And then I read that the theory is that the original tortoises floated. Yep. <laughs> from South America exactly. to the Galapagos Islands. Yeah, so tortoises do have a little bit of buoyancy <laughs> and they believe that they were on the original mainland of South America and after the archipelago came out from the ocean from you know volcanic mm -hmm. uh, you know, activity that they actually floated over. <laughs> So that's just so amazing to me, though, to look at the size of them and to think like their original tourist ancestor floated like a coconut. Yes. All the way across <laughs> the ocean. Maybe, like, do you think, well, I guess that would be evolutionary theory, wondering if it was just one gravid female or if it just, there were a lot of tortoise coconuts that just all right. made it to Right. I mean, there definitely somehow. had to be a few, a few that had to get over, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, wildlife always finds a way, usually, especially, uh, you know, in these kind of situations. I mean, amazing things happen like this, where now you have, uh, I mean, they're the only two giant tourist species in the world. One here found in, you know, found on Galapagos Islands that we keep here at San Diego Zoo, and then the other one is the Aldabra tortoises. And are they both, so they're both on islands, so probably like gigantism, no Exactly, no usually on island ecology, you see a lot of gigantism, and then also just very, you know, 
uh, small species, so it kind of has like extremes. Yeah. You either get very large or very small. And these guys decided to get big. Yeah. Very, very big. And this is Augustus coming up here. This is our saddleback. He is the only saddleback male we have in our in our herd. And I will show you how long his neck is in a second after he gets munching on that little green bit right there. And so for the saddlebacks, they're the ones that, as you mentioned, like the neck is twice as long. They kind of, they were on an island where the food was a little higher yeah, up. So they had to Yeah, you can see right here, his shell goes straight up right here, like a saddle, in a sense. Hi, mm -hmm. Augustus, do you want to show off how big your neck is? Hi, baby. You see the green? Come on, show them how tall you are. You're the biggest boy. <laughs> It'll be good next to, uh, this is, you know, Oliver, to yeah. see how tall he is compared to Oliver and Abbott. You'll see the difference he got once he goes for it. Oh, I can see him bracing. Yeah. To get himself up there. Getting ready. Patience is definitely, uh, I would imagine, something you need working with giant tortoises. They, they're used to <laughs> generations of island time. Yes. <laughs> and that's why, you know, they probably live so long. But yeah, these guys, like I said, they're all our boys here are over 100 and the oldest recorded that I know of is around 170. Wow. So yeah, I mean, they still got a lot to go. Yeah, look at that neck. Yeah, you that can see how the difference longer. compared to the other boys, yeah. And he can actually go higher than that. Wow. He's being modest right now. And Good so boy. In the wild, would he mostly be after like uh, cactuses or other types exactly. of Exactly, that's actually Augustus, one of his favorite things, is eating the cactus pads <laughs> off of the, you know, like that one over there, those really high cactus pads. He'll, you can see the bottom is kind of empty. Some bite marks out of the cactus. Yes, right exactly. Oh, yep, that's Augustus that right his there. Neck? That's yeah. so fine. Yeah, he's a big boy, and he's over uh, 500 pounds. So all our boys here range from 400 to 550 pounds. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, they're about twice the size as our females. The females range from 250 to 350, around there. Okay, <laughs> there you go. One more. <laughs> there here you go, Abbott. And I know that the zoos worked a lot with the Galapagos tortoises back on Galapagos. Yeah, so back in the 70s, we had a Galapagos tortoise here named Diego who actually went back to the islands and is now helped repopulate a huge part of their population. Uh, I think it's in the hundreds he's had offspring there. Wow, is yeah. he, I think there, at one point there were only about like 13 or something really, really low exactly, for these tortoises. Exactly, yeah. So some of the subspecies unfortunately are extinct now and some are very critically endangered and low. Some are just endangered. It depends on the species. Some of them are more uh, critical than others. And here they're all part of the species survival plan. So we are trying to breed them and yeah. always help even with a uh, population here at the zoo will help, you know, just there you go, you got it. Just keep them going. Well, and yeah, have we'll that keep, diversity. Well, it's basically like a reassurance uh, population. Yeah. They call it here in human care. Well, and considering these guys are well over a hundred, are they outside of the tortoise like breeding range for their age, or nope. would they? Oh, you guys could. Still yeah, be so reptiles are not like mammals in that sense. <laughs> they have that superpower where they can keep breeding all the way past 100. <laughs> That's amazing. How many eggs do they lay when the females do lay eggs? Uh, it depends. So like a first clutch, you might have a small clutch like 10 About or 10? even less. Yeah, but I've seen clutches all the way up to 50 if it's a female who's really reproduced a lot. Yeah. And so she's just kind of, her body's used yeah, to it. Yeah, but the average is probably 20. Now I'm actually feeding them bok choy right now. Uh, they eat all types of grains. So they eat bok choy, spinach, romaine, uh, dandelion, and uh, kale as well. Wow. And it, uh, Cactuses occasionally? Do they ever get? Yeah, so they get <laughs> cactus pads, they get prickly pear, the cactus fruits, they get hibiscus, they love hibiscus. Oh, wow, really? Yep. And they also get hay. Hay is a That's huge boring. part of their diet just to help the fiber. Because in the wild, they'd be eating a lot of grass. Just constantly moving around for yep. the grass. They're Good grazers, morning. so they're constantly moving, constantly eating. <laughs> Up high, Aldo. You probably don't want my dress. That's not part of any of those awesome summer plants. <laughs> I love the pace that they move at too, because I mean, living it? on an island, they don't need to worry about much. No, unfortunately, Other their predator people. is humans. Yep. Yeah, they're, they don't really have any natural predators other than us. Well, and it's interesting because they're so big, and when I think about an island, that doesn't, that, islands are kind of, 
in my head small. I'm from Hawaii and I think about like, eh, I can kind of travel the whole length of it. Yeah. But when I was doing reading about the tortoises, it mentioned that over a hundred thousand of them were probably taken from the islands just from like the 18th century to modern day. Yes. So do you, is there any idea of how many tortoises there could be? Like if it's hard to it was just left? It's hard to say because for instance, a great story this year was on Fernandina, that island. They thought the tortoises on that island had gone extinct. It's a very volcanic island, very hard to hike. Um, I had been to Galapagos myself. Some of the islands, it's very hard to actually really get into the heart of the island. Mm -hmm. This year, a uh, researcher went for it, hiked, and actually found tortoises. You so tortoises, yep. So tortoises wow. that were thought to be extinct have been re rediscovered on Fernandina. That's uh, George's story too, wasn't it? Because he was from Pinto Island. Yes, yes, and he's one of the Pinto Islands. So he was thought to be like he was the last one right, from he Pinta. Right, he was. Yes. You want some breakfast? I love bok choy too. Very good. And you know when it gets like close to your finger, just kind yeah, of let like, him go. have mm -hmm. it. Exactly, you got it. And I can always get more. Okay, here you they go. They have a much more gentle bite than I thought, too. Here you go. Did you, they have favorites, yes. like favorite food types? Or? They definitely do. So, like I said, Augustus loves the cactus. Uh, <laughs> uh, Aldo here loves hibiscus. And pretty much all of them love pumpkin. He around. doesn't seem to want the bok choy. Should I yeah. try it? <laughs> I mean, that's all I got right now, Aldo, but yeah, he, He's more of a flower guy. He likes to eat the hibiscus and stuff, so oh, hibiscus. he might be he might be tired of the bok choy. <laughs> you good? There you go. Yeah, you got it. Here, good boy. Good job. And there, so this is basically <laughs> where he's gonna go into a finch response, which oh, we were kind of wow. talking about before. So yeah, he's gonna stand up and he's gonna go because I'm giving him these nice scratches. He's gonna go into this catatonic kind of state. And this in the wild, the little finches on the islands would come down and eat all the little dry skin and parasites off of him. So if you want, just go for his little neck area. Yeah, he loves it. And he'll sit like this for, for as long as we're here. Because <laughs> they could probably really love that, just basking in the sun yes. letting the finches clean them. Exactly. What an honor to be able to meet you. You're a very old boy. Yeah. And is he one of the originals? Yeah. So he's one of the original nine. So he's seen a lot. Yeah. <laughs> How big were they when they came? Just kind of. They were, I actually have like a black and white picture of them and they were probably like this big. Oh, yeah, because wow. they were already like about 20 years old or so. So yeah, they were, they were around that big. So you've traveled the whole world. He's so amazing because he feels almost like a tree. Yes. And, and they rock. Exactly. So their legs are very trunk like. It's basically, that's most of their weight. A lot of people think the shell is very heavy. It actually isn't. It's quite, it's quite light. It's bone, mm -hmm. modified bone. So it's not that dense as people believe, but it's really here where all their muscle is. And they have very dense, you know, thick leg bones. That's really where all the, the weight is. Yeah, I so, can see. Are those like their toenails at the bottom? Yeah. That are kind of mixing with their scales? Yep. They yeah, this is thing. amazing. He really does feel kind of like touching, yeah, like just like a smooth rock on mm -hmm. his scales. And then a lot of people compare them to elephants too. Yeah, they yeah. They look the same kind of like skin as like a pachyderm. <laughs> and does that help him uh, with regulation, like in, in temperature by any chance? Uh, you go, yeah, definitely, because these guys are ectotherms, as you know. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're cold blooded, so they rely on outside temps. So a lot of their shell and their skin helps absorb a lot of that heat that they need. So on a cooler morning like this, is he kind of pulling on heat that he may have saved from like the previous day, or is he just kind of warming up right now? Yeah, exactly. He's pretty much just warming up. If he has any leftover energy, it would be very little. And also, it's just they're not in, at night. They're sleeping. So he kind of is able, just like us sleeping, he's able to save that energy for the morning. <laughs> But he's been in California so long, it's kind of, you know, they've adapted to this so weather. He's used to the yeah. Weather. And right behind you, this big a rock structure, it's actually a giant barn inside. So if I oh, walk nice. behind those rocks, it's a heated barn that they can go in at night if they want to get a little more toasty. Because California does get a little cool here at night, mm -hmm. so we want to make sure that they have the temperatures that they would have in Galapagos. So yeah, we heat that up nice and warm so they can eat in there. That's my dress. Sleep That's in there not if they bok want. choy. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, Oliver. Oliver's like, I, I want all the attention too. <laughs> He's a good boy. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my mic. 
Oh, is he going for my dress? Oh, Aldo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Mood. Like I told you, he's the he's the flower guy. He loves hibiscus and stuff. So. Oh well, you know I love them too. <laughs> what an unforgettable experience! It felt like being surrounded by moving, leaf-eating boulders who had stepped right out of history to eat bok choy straight from my hands. And it was so amazing to watch as Danielle's eyes lit up and she diligently set about tidying up the sands and the pools of their exhibit, taking care of tortoises easily three times our age. She cared deeply about the amazing creature she was in charge of, and it made me so eager to be able to take care of them too. Thankfully, I can do just that. In real life, I can raise awareness about the importance of conservation, and very soon, I will be able to take care of my own Galapagos tortoises in Planet Zoo. I'll be able to use my creativity and ideas to sculpt what I hope will be magnificent naturalistic zoos in my own digital world, and I'll be able to populate it with over 50 different species of animals. The animals in Planet Zoo are utterly beautiful and depicted with so much dedication to the details, the unique quirks, and the behaviors of the real-life animals that they represent. After spending a week at the real San Diego Zoo, it was so much fun to explore the Planet Zoo beta and see how the digital animals acted just like their real-life counterparts. Planet Zoo is overflowing with information about the real animals, too. The Planet Zoo Zoopedia really feels like having a personal zookeeper there, helping me to learn all about the animals we share our amazing world with. Thanks to Frontier and Planet Zoo, I not only had the opportunity to be a real-life zookeeper for a day, but I also get to be a zookeeper across dozens of zoos and for hundreds of animals as I bring my dream zoos to life. The power to create, conserve, and explore our curiosity will soon be in our hands. I can't wait to see where your own zookeeping dreams will lead you. Who knows? Perhaps thanks to Planet Zoo, your curiosity and love of the world will grow so much that one day you'll end up becoming a real zookeeper too.